this or that, but mine really boils down to, to two quick things. One, uh, growing up freedom of speech, absolutely, and I believe that uh, of the virus up until everyone can get vaccinated for COVID. Right. Hello everyone and welcome. I would like to thank MPP Pacini for joining me today. Uh, David, thank you. Um, and we'll just get started right away. So my first question, David, um, is why did you become a politician? Uh, but in particular, why did you uh, become a conservative? Thanks, Wyatt. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think, I suppose, one of the reasons I decided to become a politician, well, it's twofold. One, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, will give you well-scripted answers on, you know, why they wanted to do this or that. But mine really boils down to, to two quick things. One, uh, growing up, I was always really close to my grandfather, um, my papa, and he, uh, he worked for the United Nations and saw really a career was grounded from a young age in, in public service and, and what he'd done uh, working for the United Nations. So that was really my upbringing. And then um, it really pushed me into getting active and involved when I was on uh, at University of Ottawa and uh, cancel culture really pushed me in uh, to getting involved and likely probably contributes to one of the reasons I've uh, become a proud conservative. Um, you know, I found it really, uh, I found universities are a great place where you can go debate, um, have, have rich debate and should be really, I believe in, in freedom of speech, absolutely. And I believe that uh, nowhere more so than universities where we should be encouraged to sort of lay our ideas out and, and debate them. And when you're formulating those ideas at sort of that formative young age in university, it, it's through people critiquing it. It's through laying it out on the table freely and seeing others' reactions that you can help sort of develop your thought process. And, um, you know, the, the, the left uh, on campus at uh, Ottawa U who would try and censor anyone that dares uh, disagree with them was just one of the reasons that I, I got involved. And um, it really, it, it, you know, pushed me into, uh, into joining, you know, a, a party that really, I feel believes in, you know, fundamentally in that freedom of speech. Um, you know, my dad, small business owner as well, a respect for the taxpayer, a belief in, um, you know, in, in effective government, but limited government. And, you um, and so, you know, that's really driven me to where I am today. I had the opportunity to get involved in Ottawa. Obviously, you're in the nation's capital. You see politics. And uh, working in healthcare really pushed me to get involved, to see a healthcare system that's centered around managing sick people instead of helping people uh, not get sick. So chronic disease prevention instead of chronic disease management. So, you know, there's a whole whack of reasons that I got involved, and I'll probably have to work on my stump speech for for next time but those are some of the reasons that I decided to get involved well yeah because uh before you became MPP for Northumberland Peterborough South you ran in Ottawa Vanier I believe correct mm -hmm. yeah I mean I always was politically active I was very you know I was younger when I did that and I was active uh at that point I was just starting to get involved with the party I knew a lot of people was heavily involved in the community as a coach as working you know in small business there and, uh, you know, it was one of the reasons I got involved and I learned a lot. You learn such a great deal about yourself, about one's capabilities. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that experience. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I grew up in small town here in Port Hope. Um, you know, my family it lives here. I love uh, rural community and uh, life's changing. You know, we're being pushed and squeezed by folks moving out from the city, inflating the housing market. And, uh, you know, and I think it's high time we had someone who can keep up with that, someone young, ready to, to take on the challenge to build a sort of community that we want to live, work and raise a family. And, um, you know, your example, your family's grown up and, and living in rural Ontario. And that's what I want. You know, when I have kids, that's what I want to live in rural Ontario and uh, be able to live, work and play and it right here. And uh, we've got to preserve that way of life. I mean, our ag land is being squeezed. Um, you know, people are being squeezed out of their homes because we're not building enough supply. And, um, and it's high time we had a government that stood up for, um, you know, for these, for the landowners, for rural Ontario, and for, you know, for our business community. I know it's kind of rich saying that in the middle of a lockdown, but, but, you know, the measures we've taken to support small business, I fundamentally believe in. 
Okay, great. Um, so the next one is, um, obviously, I know you mentioned before we started that uh, your government is uh, very busy, including yourself with the new announcement today, because uh, your government today released projections showing that if no further action is taken, we could see um, close to 40,000 cases of COVID a day. Uh, your government also announced today a stay at home order. Uh, is the stay at home order essentially an effort to slow the spread of the virus up until everyone can get vaccinated for COVID? I absolutely. I mean, I think that's the 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 idea is to get our case count to a manageable a manageable level, and it's not just cases because I understand that people can be asymptomatic, but it's the spread. If the spread is increasing, and we've seen you know a seventy five percent increase in uh, in hospitalizations just over the last sort of four week period, that really underpins my my need for action, and and that need is surrounds uh, you know a fundamental desire and and belief that we must as a government protect the integrity of the healthcare system and it's not just for covid um, but it's when we see that sort of increase in hospitalizations that means that's one fewer bed for for someone hit in a head-on collision i mean i'm sorry to be very direct but the reality is that you know just met a constituent who's waiting to get uh, an important x-ray and ultrasound for for uh, you know remission in cancer when that's put off and you don't hear those and those elective measures are put off people's health is at risk and um you know for for me we've got to improve and not only improve our healthcare system but maintain its integrity and that's why we've made these very difficult decisions yeah, well, because it's obviously not an, e an easy decision to shut down um, the economy for the second time. But I mean, when, to when, when Tony Clement came on, he made a good point. He said uh, that, that there's one of two paths, but that he would lean more towards one way. Um, and the way that he said he would lean towards is doing a full, complete lockdown, because um, the lockdown that was announced today, I ultimately think is what Ontario needs, because for the past couple of weeks, we've seen sort of a lockdown, but I don't really think a lockdown that um, could lower cases to the amount that we need to to reopen again. Yeah, you're right. I think the, the stay at home order is certainly unique and the declaration of state of emergency, which we, of course, first did a number of months ago. And, and the idea is that a lot of people I know are and understand are making great sacrifice, but we need to put in place some some tough measures to get this under control so that we can, you know, stabilize our healthcare system so that we can, um, you know, be in a position where far more Ontarians are vaccinated and we can get this economy back up and running. Uh, and once again, to the strength that it was before. Okay. Um, the next one is obviously COVID spreading rapidly. Um, but a new statistic that was released showed that, that one in five kids uh, are testing positive for COVID. Um, does this statistic worry you? Um, but in particular, does it worry you in the sense that the return to school could be delayed once again? Yeah, um, it's a troubling statistic for sure, is that, uh, you know, specifically those in elementary uh, school age. And as the premier said today, you know, it just takes a couple elementary kids in school to come back home at the dinner table, infect their parents. One I, of thought those that parents. Was, I thought that was one of the greatest things ever that he said today, cause, and it was yeah. point proven that most definitely. Yeah. And one of those parents then goes, you know, my girlfriend, for example, is the caregiver for her grandmother. Um, you know, and she doesn't know it because she's asymptomatic. We've, you know, maintained uh, our bubble and then she goes and infects, you know, our grandmother and then, you know, God forbid her grandmother passes away. So this is why, you know, we've taken these measures and, and the concern um, is that, you know, the, the classroom setting uh, could quickly become in an untenable position where school boards are, are faced with mass uh, school closures, which would affect obviously busing, affect uh, deployment of staff, and you're in a position where a board could have scores and scores of schools shut down. And I think, you know, rather than 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 tackle that on a month by month basis, I think the more prudent decision is, you know, following the the strict measures, the difficult measures that we've put in place. Let's get this manageable, and then let's open schools and continue with the responsible management of schools as we've done. I mean, you heard the doomsday prophecies from some when uh, we opened schools a number of months back and that never materialized and it didn't materialize because we put in place safe measures for a resumption of school. That's not to say that there wasn't some cases because there was, but it was manageable considering the hundreds of thousands of students that go to school on an everyday basis. So, um, you know, we've got to 
I think this pushing this off into February is responsible. And again, in some regions of the province, we could see potential reopening on the 25th. Yeah, and e even as a, a student, and I'm uh, assuming that a lot of other students think the same way, is I'd rather um, close schools down until it's fully safe to reopen, then close them and then open them again, then close them and then open them again. Yeah, exactly. And imagine what that would do for you, right? So I think it's just you've got... There's also something to be said about consistency too. I mean, you're you're you've settled into the the reality and uh, constantly disrupting that, going back and forth. I think is ultimately more damaging than um, than you know a few extra weeks online and then a, hopefully a return that would be a return in uh, in perpetuity. And you know, again, to date, I think the government has been responsible in those actions. Uh, with respect to, you know, ensuring that schools open and when they open, open safely. And to date, the Chief Medical Officer of Health has not steered us wrong on that. Okay, great. Uh, the next one is, um, I've asked all the guests that come on this show this question because I feel it's important in just in regards to leadership. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same one. Um, and this isn't just with politicians, whether you're conservative, liberal, it's just politicians across the whole board. But many politicians uh, including Tracy Allard, Rod Phillips, three Liberal MPs, and a select few uh, federal Conservative MPs were caught traveling out of the country over the holidays. Um, what steps do you think should be taken uh, to hold these politicians accountable? And do you think that these politicians should have to go as far as resigning? Well, ultimately, look, I think that any sort of these sorts of actions really rock the, the bedrock of confidence that people place in their elected members. You elect your members confident that they're gonna work hard to represent your interests. And we understand that politicians are held to a higher account. And you know, I think, I think that the actions that they made are beyond ridiculous. Um, I think it's stupid to be frank, excuse the language on what they did. But it's outrageous. I mean, you shouldn't be traveling when when Ontarians are making mass sacrifice. People aren't seeing their loved ones, and it's it's unacceptable. So I think the responsible uh, decision is uh, to remove them from the, the positions, um, you know, uh, that that many of them were were in. And I think we saw again the premier, at least in Ontario, took that very seriously. Uh, the the higher account that we're held to, and um, and, uh, and and the right decision was made there, but. Um, you know, ultimately, Wyatt, I would also say, too, that I, I think we want good people representing us. And one of the sad realities of that, and I don't blame people for this, but I mean, there's been people uh, publicly saying, you know, um, go down to Dave's place and monitor him and sit outside his place and circle around and, you know, scare my girlfriend when she's getting up in the morning, having a coffee and, you know, hasn't, you know, myself too, uh, you know, like, to shoot straight. I mean, I'm in my PJs having a quick coffee. It's 530 in the morning. And I'm getting ready for work. And I've got people peering in my window wondering if, you know, I'm off somewhere. I understand their frustration. And, and it's, it's justified given the actions of the select few. But let's not drive politics to the bottom where, where nobody wants to seek this this office and we just have bad people representing us. Um, let's also not paint, you know, a, a whole swath of people who admirably serve their constituents. And, you know, I think there's great politicians of a number of stripes. We saw, you know, the, 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 the respect paid to Navdeep Baines today, you know, we're different, diff, uh, different parties, but I've had conversations with him on the innovation front that showed me that he's a decent man in politics for the right reasons, working hard. Um, you know, I think to local politicians that have worked hard here too, John O'Toole, you know, I think of, uh, of, of Bev, I think of Rick Norlock, Doug Galt, um, you know, conversations I've had with former MP uh, Kim Rudd as well. I mean, there's a lot of people who give up a lot to seek office and, uh, you know, who give up every day to try their best. And so, you know, while I would say the criticisms are justified, um, you know, I would also say um, that, that, you know, we have to elevate ourselves to a higher account and, and restore that trust with, with Ontarians and with Canadians. Yeah, and um, it's quite shameful, honestly, because you mentioned about how people um, will come to your house, but then also even if you turn on CP24 or whatever and you see that there's people uh, surrounding the Premier's house um, because they didn't like, let's say, the announcement that he made earlier in the day, which is, uh, would I'm sure uh, Premier Ford is scared about that and uh, scared about people putting his family in danger? 
Yeah, there used to be sort of an unwritten rule in Canadian politics. And while we see, the, you know, dismantling of this in other jurisdictions, I was always proud that in Canada, usually family and your family life was off limits. And that's increasingly changing and we're becoming more Americanized. We're, um, we're seeing a real polarization of politics. And I think it's shameful, you know, going outside the premier's house. I mean, at the end of the day, he's given up a lot to, to represent this province and was duly elected by the people. And I, you know, you can take those grievances to the front, front uh, lawn at Queen's Park. You can take them to the offices that we sit in. You can take them, be it our constituency office or be it the office uh, in Toronto. You can take them there. But going to people's homes, I mean, the, his neighbor, the kids that play hockey on his street, they didn't sign up for that. And I think it's really unfair. And, and you know what people will do is if you continue the race to the bottom for, for politics, don't be surprised. Um, having increasingly worse politicians representing you, um, because who would want to to represent, uh, seek office if that's if that's the inevitable reality that they can be held to, uh, or that's the inevitable reality I should say for, for them. So I, I do think you know we've got to respect one another, respect our differences, um, take the fact that many people lost their lives on the beaches of Normandy and and elsewhere, so that you have the freedom to go and throw eggs at Queen's Park. You have the freedom to go and sit there all night with a loudspeaker shouting profanities at, at uh, any one of us in the legislature. But a lot of people paid a steep price so that we can have those sorts of freedoms. And, and when we, we as a government have to sort of invoke incredibly difficult measures, I'm constantly reminded of that to this day, um, you know, that a lot of people paid the price for that. So let's I think if we could all just be a little nicer and uh, disagree, disagree vehemently, uh, but don't cancel each other out and don't try and, uh, you know, I think there's a respectful way of doing it. Oh, great. Uh, good. Uh, so my next question is, your government's handling of the pandemic has boosted their approval rating significantly. According to 338 Canada, uh, the most recent poll showed that if, uh, if an election were held in the province of Ontario today, uh, the PCs would win 87 seats, the NDP would win 22 the Liberals would win 13. Uh, what's interesting here is that the NDP is still ahead of the Liberals. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's a reason they're ahead of the independent uh, members is because, um, you know, they, I would say this, I've worked, uh, had the opportunity to work with a lot of NDP members and um, they brought forward some, some really constructive ideas and people understand what they stand for. Um, you know, I still uh, still struggle with uh, with some of the things I hear uh, from the, the independent members. But at the end of the day, look, I think, um, you know, I'm proud of the record that we've run on as a, as a party. And I'm proud of the measures we've taken to systemically change our healthcare system from community paramedicine to increasing funding for our hospitals, transit to finally get shovels in the ground, building expanded transit like we've never seen before in this province, actually building long-term care beds from the paltry 611 new net new beds brought in over a decade to brand new facilities that aren't warehousing four seniors in a room, but moving to private and semi-private, giving people the dignity of that care in their final years, investing in new strategies for new workers. I mean, there, I could go on for days, new manufacturing. We have more manufacturing jobs today in the middle of a pandemic with lock Lockdowns than we did under the previous Liberal government. So I don't think Ontarians have forgotten that as we grapple with hydro rates, etc., the legacy issues. Um, and, and you know what? They understand what the NDP stand for and they understand what the PC party stands for. Okay. Uh, the next one is Randy Hillier, the NDP MPP for or independent, independent MPP yeah. rather, uh, for Kingston, has posted pictures of his family uh, gathering for Christmas. Why is Randy Hillier allowed to gather for Christmas and not get a fine when the people of Ontario could not? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to ultimately, I think, speak to Ottawa police, I believe it is, or bylaw on that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, Randy too well. I've had the opportunity to have a couple chats with him. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we were, we're um, we all work hard to serve the people we represent. And that's, uh, nobody's disputing that Randy does that. Certainly when we were, um, you know, I didn't see him too much uh, in caucus or, or in a team when we were there, um, when he was a part of, uh, of our caucus, but, uh, but he has been an independent for, um, you know, a, well over a year now. And, uh, you know, he's, he's working to represent his constituents, but as, a, as far as the actions he took over Christmas, I think it's a painful yet again reminder um, of, uh, you know, of 
of a double standard of politicians. That's unfair. And you know what? I think he does get that deep down. I, I know also he doesn't believe in, um, you know, in certain uh, certain realities we're seeing in our healthcare system. But, you know, uh, again, we're in a free and fair democracy and he's entitled to his beliefs. I don't have to like them. I don't have to like what he's done, but he's, uh, he's able to do it. And the fact that he broke, um, you know, what was asked in those guidelines, ultimately, I do think um, that uh, I do think that there should have been measures in place to address that. But then again, I mean, also it's incredibly difficult to enforce. Let's not forget when he has people over to his house in rural Ontario. Um, you know what? Uh, it's not like anyone was sitting outside and saw that. It's an after the fact post. So mm-hmm. it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge, no doubt, to to do this. And but but we're a free democracy. We're not an authoritarian country, right? We don't have scores of police officers on our street. We have our police who are there to keep us safe. We have proactive policing, community-based policing. And um, and it, so it's incredibly difficult as democracies grapple with these sort of increased strict measures. It, we're not built in a democracy for this sort of stuff. And we're seeing it uh, full, full-fledged right now, the, the challenges in, in implementing it. Okay, um, my next one is um, <laughs> Minister Stephen Lecce has said that schools uh, will return for uh, January the 25th, I think, 25th. Yeah. Do you remain confident that uh, that will happen? Well, I think what the minister is trying to do is give as much sort of stability to parents and, and be forthright with them. Parents say, we want to hear, we want to know what he's thinking. And he does it. And then they say, well, you know, you change things. And yeah, of course we change things. When we're given numbers like the one that you mentioned earlier about one in five elementary students testing positive, um, you know, we have to act, right? And it would be irresponsible for the minister to ignore in, in the face of data. And you know what would happen if he said, well, I said this, and then I got new info from our chief medical officer of health, but because I told parents that I'm not changing my decision, you know what the same parents would say? Why aren't you, why aren't you keeping our kids safe? Why are you sending them back? So for some, it's a catch-22. You can never win, but I think the minister constantly, one thing that stands above all that is that the minister has been driven by the guidance from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, been driven by the best science and evidence on this and made informed decisions. And I fully support him in that. Okay, and uh, my second to last question for today is uh, many people often say that voting doesn't matter. Um, And then they say that politicians don't have enough power to deliver the real change that they want. What would you say to uh, those people? Well, I would say, you know, I'm, I know there are, there are all sorts of issues, and I think this stems right back to the Westminster system of Westminster, Westminster democracy that we're in. And I do believe in that system. I've seen other jurisdictions that have, have uh, pondered, you know, different systems of governance that have resulted in all sorts of, um, you know, ultra fringe parties creating, you know, gridlock and chaos that has resulted in inability to move really any agenda forward. Um, but, you know, I think it's ultimately up to the people. And if you want to change the system in which the people um, are, you know, choose their governments, you got to put it to the people, one person, one vote. And so, um, you know, I think we have taken these, we've contemplated these mixed member proportions and other models and Ontarians rejected it in, in our history. So, you know, of course, every system has its, has its challenges, uh, but, but the Westminster system that I'm a part of, we've seen co- remarkable collaboration at all levels of government in the face of, you know, a very, of, of arguably a global pandemic, the likes of which we've, we've really haven't seen um, arguably ever before. And, um, you know, we've worked with members of the opposition. We have vigorous debate in our party. People are, speak freely. And, you know, I often uh, talk about areas I think our government could have done a better job. I speak out and, and, uh, and up on them often. And uh, we're able to deliver things for our constituents. And ultimately, I'm going to be held to task on what I did for our community. And people can ask them, you know, what did Dave do for us? What did he do for our roads? What did he do for our transit? What did he do for our healthcare system? And, you know, I'm excited and will continue to work and tell people about the things I and our government are doing in our community. But I do support Westminster democracy. I support this system. I think, um, yeah, it has its challenges, but I think Canadians and and various provinces and and Canada has done very well through this global pandemic. We've done uh, very well over the past number of decades under success of different governments of different stripes. So, um, you know, I will continue to support um, the Westminster system that we're a part of right now. 
Okay, great. Um, here, one second. The next question I have for you is um, what Andrea Horvath, the leader of the official opposition and leader of the NDP, reacted to your government's new measures that were imposed. She criticized them, even though she has been asking for these measures for the for weeks. Uh, what would you say to Ms. Horvath? Well, I would say just uh, be clear on what it is you're asking for. You know, you've the to the NDP's credit, they've asked for you know different measures for staffing and long-term care. We've implemented them. You know, four hours of care, we've implemented it. We worked with them on it. We've worked with them on implementing an emergency declaration. Um, and now, you know, you, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. I, I understand the role of the opposition is there to to criticize and to hold the government to account. But uh, to criticize just for the sake of criticizing, uh, people start to see through that. And, um, and you know, I think uh, there are many instances in which I give credit to the NDP for some of the ideas that they brought forward. Um, here, you know, the measures we've taken are incredibly difficult, but they've been guided by doctors. And, you know, you can't say, listen to the doctors, the government's listening to the doctors, listening to the science, listening uh, to the modeling that our best physicians, I mean, these are people who've poured their life into their profession. And, you know, of course, there's going to be those, oh, I can find you a doctor who disagrees, or I can find you someone, you know, in Seattle, Washington, or Florida, who's going to disagree with it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there are people who who understand our system, who understand our publicly funded system of healthcare, people who've devoted their careers um, and spent decades in schooling. Um, and, and we rely on them. We rely on the people on the front lines. You know, when I want to hear the challenges our cops are facing, I go into a ride along with our police. I spend a night shift with them. When I want to know what's happening in our factories, I'll go and visit. I'll, you know, tour the tour the, the floor and, and talk to workers. When I want to know what's going on in our hospital, I'll go tour like I did at Christmas time or have a round table with doctors like I'm about to do in the coming days, nurses, healthcare professionals. When the nurses are angry and upset and pick up my office, I invite them in, give them coffee and say, well, what's your issue? What can I help you with? And so for me, I lean, I don't get my ideas out of, out of a pocket here or or they just come to me. I lean on the people I represent, experts in their field who've devoted a life into what they've done. And uh, I'll take my advice from them. So, um, you know, we're going to continue listening to the experts who have guided us through this pandemic. And uh, we'll, when, you know, we'll continue to make these decisions as difficult as they may be, but with the overarching guiding principle to protect the health and well being of Ontarians. Okay. Thank you very much, David, for uh, coming on uh, the podcast today. Yeah. Thanks for asking me on, Wyatt. I appreciate it. Thank you. Keep up the great work.